World Series shifts to New York after a huge start, though we're still waiting to see if the league's biggest star will continue playing in the series. Plus, we're talking to an MLB legend and one of the main people working to revive spring football. We also have stories from the NFL, NBA, WNBA, and college football. It's Monday, October 28th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, my colleague Eric Fisher joins to talk about his time in Los Angeles covering the World Series and the early returns from the first two games. Later, we're speaking with MLB Hall of Famer Reggie Jackson, who has a long history with the Yankees, but is taking time in the middle of this World Series to host the Legends game in Oakland. We're also speaking with Russ Brandon, president and CEO of the United Football League, on the first season of the latest attempt to bring back spring football. Plus, Tua Tagovailoa took the field again, Bronny James will spend time in the G League, and the NBA revealed its courts for the in-season tournament. First, here are your top headlines. We began on a positive note with a rare win for one of football's notoriously meddlesome and problematic owners, David Tepper of the Carolina Panthers. In the wake of Hurricane Helene, Tepper's Bank of America Stadium hosted a benefit called Concert for Carolina, headlined by country singer Luke Combs. The event raised over $24 million, and Adam Schefter reports that Tepper donated every dollar made at the stadium from the concert, which saw over 82,000 people show up to support. To another owner in the South, Jeff Vinnick announced late last week that he had officially sold his majority stake of the Tampa Bay Lightning and paid out $20 million in bonuses to team staff on his way out. Vinnick will still retain control of the franchise for the next three years as new owners Doug Ostrover and Mark Lipschultz transition into power and appoint a board of directors to oversee strategic operations. They have a lot to live up to. The Lightning have made the playoffs 11 times in the past 14 seasons and have won two Stanley Cups under Vinnick. Over in the WNBA, the Indiana Fever decided to part ways with coach Christy Sides on Sunday morning. Even after their first playoff berth since 2016, the team has gone 33-47 and in two seasons under Sides, but won 18 of their last 27 games this season. Despite the positive trend, Fever president Kelly Krauskopf said that this, it is imperative that we remain bold and assertive in the pursuit of our goals, which includes maximizing our talent and bringing another WNBA championship back to Indiana. Indiana becomes the sixth WNBA team to fire their coach this offseason. Speaking of lofty goals, the Colorado Buffaloes are not satisfied after clinching a bowl game this weekend with a win over Cincinnati. Head coach Deion Sanders said of the accomplishment, It's cute. It really is. Because we really want that, but that's not all we're after. The ceiling is high for the star-studded Buffaloes, led by college sports' two highest-earning NIL stars in Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter. Coach Prime said after the big win that, We're not even hitting our peak. Nowhere close. Game three of MLB's Dream World Series is tonight, and the ratings have delivered as hoped, with Friday's Game 1 drawing an audience of over 15.2 million viewers, peaked at 17.8 million. The Dodgers and MLB seem to have survived a scare after their star Shohei Otani dislocated his shoulder in Game 2. He will apparently be ready for Game 3. My colleague Eric Fisher joins next to discuss the series so far and how big a factor Otani has been. I'm joined now by newsletter writer Eric Fisher, back from L.A. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Great to have you on. And so, yeah, you, you were there for the first two games of the World Series in Los Angeles. Uh, just first of all, what was that experience like? Yeah, the atmosphere was electric. I've been to Dodger Stadium many times and for multiple prior World Series. This just seemed to be at a whole other level um, for a variety of reasons. Certainly the stars and the team that they have now. Um and the prior championship that they had was uh, smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. So the city really never really got to celebrate that team. This they, The fan base really feels like, and obviously as we're talking, they're already up 2-0. It feels like this, this is the team that could now get over the hump yet again. Um, you know, just lots of energy with all those stars, you know, Ice Cube before game two. Um, it just really, all these things sort of adding in, it just seemed to be at a, a whole other level than even compared to prior visits I've had to Dodger Stadium. Yeah, and just on like on the Ice Cube thing, I feel like, L.A. taps into its celebrities, I'd say even more than New York, maybe. I mean, like the Knicks might be an exception there, but um, I feel like they're not just in the crowd. They're like on the field a lot of the time. They're they're pumping up the crowd. Yeah, the, the whole thing with, uh, you know, today was a good day. It's sort of even though that's a, you know, older song, it's still very much of a vibe, still very much of that whole West Coast rap thing. It reminded me a little bit in 09 with the Yankees Phillies World Series when they uh uh, debuted Empire State of Mind, um, and they sort of played that before the game. Um, similar sort of thing, but again, uh, you think about 
you know, when the Super Bowl was at SoFi Stadium and how these leagues do so well to tap into West Coast hip hop. Um, you know, this was yet another example of that. Let's hop to a slightly different topic, which is that um, Shohei Otani dislocated his shoulder trying to steal second in game two. I think definitely for U.S. fans, I mean, I perk up a little bit more when when he's at bat. But uh, obviously in Japan, he's, and they he's the big draw. Too. Every time the lineup flips over and he, it was the top of the order and his walk-up music comes in, there was just this crescendo in the crowd that Otani's coming to bat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and like along those lines, let's get into – so game one viewership was 15.2 million average. Um, the peak was over 17 million. How yep. impressive is that number for MLB? It's great. Uh, best number in seven years since we had the seven game series between the Dodgers and the Astros. Uh, but if you sort of put it in the context of sort of the all of the decline in the traditional pay TV universe uh, to get a number like that, uh, it speaks very well of the game and speaks of the, the health of the sport right now. And we're still waiting on that Japanese number. That's probably going to come on Monday. And it would not surprise me if we get an even larger number out of Japan, even though they have one third of the population. Yeah, that has been the pattern with the Dodgers. And you, you know, at the games, you're able to speak to Rob Manfred and another number of others. Uh, what is the commissioner, um, you know, how's he seeing this series as, you know, a springboard to greater things for MLD? Yeah, there's a sort of like both a uh, culmination and an acceleration of a lot of things that they've been working on in terms of marketing the players more, nationalizing the sport and sort of getting out of that regional box that they've been in, pushing more of the international thing, engaging more with young people. A lot of those things are sort of coming to the fore with this Star Stud series the way that it is. Uh, so they're feeling very good about that and what it sort of could mean for the health of the sport uh, overall. There are some other sort of side issues with specific clubs that we got into as well that are still concerns. The A's and the Rays of which, you know, I've talked with you many times on this podcast. You've had others talking about though. We talked a lot about those issues as well. They're still hanging out there. But in terms of the overall health of the sport and what this series is indicative of that, you know, a lot of optimism there. Did, did he speak to any, um, you know, how, how they're going to like take this moment in time of we've got the Yankees Dodgers in the World Series, we've got Otani, we've got Judge, we've got all these big stars. How do you take these this two weeks and make that something that goes beyond, you know, into next season? You just really lean all the more into the talent of these particular players. Now, obviously, they're specific to these teams. And, you know, Juan Soto may be on a different team. We'll have to see. But, uh, you sort of start with the extraordinary talent of these particular players that are involved and then sort of lean into, well, you know, baseball was kind of an everyday thing for you during this month. It wasn't that great. And let's sort of keep having baseball be an everyday thing. So again, it really kind of starts with the players and their talent and sort of, okay, this was a great month, but we've got another season coming up kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. And on the A's and Rays, any updates there other than, I don't know what we already know. So uh, a little bit. Uh, so in the case of the A's, uh, there was an agreement, and you may have discussed this before, that they're not going to go artificial turf, even with both the major league team and the minor league team uh, playing there. Uh, the players were very insistent that having that kind of heat there uh, on artificial turf was a non-starter. And so they made the agreement to play on natural grass. And... Uh, there's pretty much an acknowledgement on both sides. That's going to require a lot of upkeep and probably resodding the field, maybe even multiple times in a given year during these three years. So could be many, many resoddings. And the way the commissioner was talking about that is like, well, this is kind of the, the, cost of admission if we're going to do this and the player safety is paramount and in the grand scheme of things yes is an expense of time and money and manpower and so forth but that's what needed to be done and there was sort of he sort of felt it was a pretty straightforward thing that as they got into that discussion this was this was the right way to go in the case of the rays um a much more uncertainty there that uh Nothing is official, nothing is certain, but the vibe that just continues to be coming out is that uh, certainly not for the start of the 2025 season and maybe much longer. And some folks I've been talking to are even suggesting, you know, do they even bother at this point that they 
Rays have a new stadium coming in 28. Uh, and they're kind of short timers in the trop anyway. Once you go to a temporary solution, do you just talk about it for the entire three years? We're not there in any official sense yet, but it's starting to get to the point where those kind of conversations may become a little louder and that kind of chatter may become a little bit louder. Um, so, but that assessment is going to continue and hopefully we'll have a little bit more clarity on where this is going by Christmas. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously the price tag of fixing that roof and whatever else needs to be fixed there. There's is, much more. Is, it's not it's just the huge. roof. Right. Right. Yeah. And if that's, you know, like hundred million dollars, are they going to like spend that? just to play there for another two and a half seasons like i don't know um i guess we'll find out eric fisher thanks so much for joining us on the show yeah a medical test can reveal your body's biological age which can show if you are aging prematurely better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age my hope of living longer and healthier is why i take field of greens Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. The NBA revealed its court designs for the in-season tournament, which is now called the Emirates NBA Cup, and they are much more consistent than last year's courts. Last year, teams were given license to go all over the place with their tournament courts, and they did, some more successfully than others. This year, all of them have the same basic structure, with an image of the trophy on both ends and at center court. Each court is colored to fit the home team, and they do have images, but they're fairly subtle, kind of the equivalent to a pattern mode into the outfield grass. Some teams, like the Knicks, Mavericks, and Lakers, went with a skyline on their court. Others did something fairly intuitive based on their branding, such as the Magic, who put star shapes on their court. And the Pacers, who are, for some reason, always the most ostentatious with these things, have the words boom baby taking up nearly the entire court. All in all, the courts look pretty sleek and should do a good job of reminding people that the tournament is different from other regular season games, which is the point of them in the first place. It remains to be seen if they're able to fix the bigger issues from last year, which is that some of them were too slippery and had the three-point line in the wrong place. Sticking with basketball, Bronny James will spend time with both the Lakers and their G League team, which plays just outside of LA in El Segundo. This whole situation was set up for a lot of potential awkwardness, but they've handled it really well so far. They got the big moment out of the way with Bronny and LeBron taking the court together in the first game, and now they're doing what's best for his development, which is to get regular minutes mixed in with tastes of NBA action. We'll see what that means for the hype around the Lakers. The team had the most expensive average ticket in the NBA, according to TickPick, at $329 to start the season. That's a 15% increase over last year. Over to the NFL, the Miami Dolphins and Tua Tagovailoa made their case on Sunday that everything is fine. The quarterback took the field for the first time since the second week of the season when he sustained a concussion. He played the whole game, throwing for 234 yards and a touchdown in a 27-28 loss to the Cardinals. Dolphins coach Mike McDaniel said that zero medical experts advised Tua to retire. For me, this remains the most tense situation in the NFL. Tua Tagovailoa has no desire to give up his career. He basically brushed off the notion that he is at greater risk than other players when speaking to the press. He's not even wearing a guardian cap, which honestly seems crazy to me because obviously he is at greater risk than other players. Any play that he's on the field could lead to another concussion and more concern for the health of his brain in the short term and the long term. I'm happy for him that he gets to play the game he loves. I'm happy for the Dolphins and their fans that their very talented quarterback is back on the field. And I'll be relieved when he finally does decide to call it a career. And hopefully he will, he will be able to do that on his own terms. To MLB, sources tell Front Office Sports that the league is looking into banning players using nicotine patches during games. The concern here seems to be less about player health and more about their influence on young people watching the games. Chewing tobacco is banned by the league, but unlike the NFL, MLB still allows nicotine pouches, which as far as I can tell is basically chewing tobacco that you don't have to chew. You just absorb it through a pouch in your mouth. Baseball players used to give tobacco companies a lot of free advertising, and now that may finally be coming to an end.
Reggie Jackson won three World Series with the A's, but he earned his moniker of Mr. October for his heroics with the Yankees. Yesterday, the Hall of Famer hosted a softball game at the Oakland Coliseum with many legends from the A's. I spoke with him and Brian Amlani of Change the Game Sports, which helped put the event on. We spoke about the game, the World Series, and a very interesting story that I had not heard before about Reggie nearly becoming the A's owner instead of John Fisher. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by Hall of Famer Reggie Jackson and founder of Change the Game Sports, Brian Amlani. Welcome, Reggie. Welcome, Brian. Hey, thanks, thanks for having us. So, Reggie, you're Mr. October. This is your month. What does this time mean for you? Oh, gosh. I always say to people, when the leaves turn brown and I'll be around. I was saying that when I was playing, you know, and I was always very fortunate to be on a great team um, it, with the Oakland A's, of course. Uh, we had Rudy and Bando, and, uh, you know, we were in the World Series three years in a row. We won a, uh, the division championship five or six times in a row and uh, wound up with a couple of Hall of Famers, Catfish Hunter, um, uh, Raleigh Fingers, uh, and myself, and um, Hall of Fame manager. I know Dick Williams is in the Hall of Fame as well. Uh, and then a couple of near Hall of Famers, Burke Campanaris, Joe Rudy, Sal Bando, um, Kenny Holzman, Vita Blue. Uh, you know, it was a really special time for us. Um, and so got fortunate. And, uh, oh, I'm t- you're talking about this time of year. Um, I was in the World Series three times with, with the Yankees. And then in working with the Yankees, um, I was in the World Series uh, seven times with the, I call it the Jeter crew. Uh, was there from as a as a, an executive? I call myself a pseudo executive, but an executive pseudo executive since '93 when I went in the Hall of Fame up to 2020, and just enjoyed it. Um, was involved with the Steinbrenners and became part of the family and part of New York, and it's just just great. Um, pinstripes, 27 World Series. So um, this time of year has always been special for, for me. I've got this, this, this name of Mr. October, so it's an enjoyable time for me. And I do a lot of media. Uh, there's a lot of reminiscing. Um, it's always fun for me. Uh, a lot of people always come up and, and, and share thoughts and ideas. And so uh, it all puts a smile on my face. Yeah. And of course, you we'll, we'll get to Oakland in a moment. But um, you know, this is the Yankees aren't in the World Series quite as frequently as they, they used to be, but they're back now. What is it like seeing them in the Fall Classic? Uh, it's great. It's great seeing the Yankees in there. Um, you know, the uni- uniform is iconic. Uh, they've got iconic players on the team here now. And, you know, Aaron Judge is, is you know, the Paul Bunyan of baseball. And uh, enjoyable and great to see him play. I know the general manager since he was 22 years old or so. And I think Brian is in his 50s, um, you know. And so I and congratulated him. And, of course, Hal Steinbrenner I've known since he's 8 to 10 years old. He's in his 50s. Uh, and so the, the people around there, the clubhouse people, the people that work at the stadium, uh, the different security people that are there, all long, long-time friends. And so um, it, it's a special time. I, they're all friends. I'm, ex- I'm excited and I'm happy for them. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> Brian, right in the middle of this World Series, you and Reggie are hosting the Reggie Jackson Softball Classic at the Oakland Coliseum with a ton of A's legends and some others. You got, you know, Ricky Henderson, Dennis Eckersley, Jose Canseco, Barry Bonds, Dave Stewart, Terrell, Terrell Owens, Matt Barnes. Um, tell me about this event and the motivation to make it happen. Yeah, so Change the Game Sports, uh, this is basically our second year um, doing these types of events. It, it all kind of stemmed, and I told Reggie the story, and it all kind of stemmed from when I was a kid. You know, I, I think that's when this dream of doing something like this really started. You know, um, the first sports book I ever read was a, a book called Stealing Home. It was about Jackie Robinson, and I was just in awe of just everything about him on and off the field, what he had to endure through racism and playing and not he wasn't just a player I mean he was a player I mean the the guy could play baseball you know sometimes when you're dealing with so much off the field it affects what you do on the field you know and and somehow 
Uh, David Justice is a good friend of mine. He hosts a podcast for us. We have a Change the Game uh, baseball podcast that he does for us. And he said, you know, God had chose him for that job. God knew he could get through it. He could handle it and he could endure it. And because it takes a special person to do something, what he did. So that's where really I think it goes back to. And then over the years, when I would see all these players get their flowers and get their recognition, it was never the guys that I really adored or looked up to or idolized um, growing up as far as sports goes. You know, it wasn't the Reggie Jacksons. It wasn't the Barry Bonds. It wasn't the King Griffey Juniors. Um, and I just thought they were more deserving of their flowers. And I thought Jackie Robinson is, you know, he changed the game for every sport. You know, he, he crawled so every other athlete could walk and run. Um, and so we, we do an iteration with the LA Chargers every year called Battle of the Goats. Uh, we're doing something for Barry Bonds next year. But this event, this Sunday, was special. And as it started to come together, it was more like, this is the 2024 Field of Dreams. You got Reggie Jackson hosting. He's out there. I mean, he's he's an icon, right? And I'm going to talk about him like he's not staring right at me. But he's an icon. You know, he's he he's one of the greatest athletes, not just baseball players, athletes that ever walked earth. And we're honored that... Uh, he had the faith and the trust to put into us to, to do something right for him. And we want to make him proud. So having Ricky Henderson and Barry Bonds and Eckersley and all the guys he just mentioned come out, especially other athletes who come out and support Matt Barnes is going to be out there. Um, tons of other guys are going to be out there. And a big initiative for us too is, is including the ladies. You'll see a lot of female professional softball players, uh, influencers, actresses um, that'll be out there. And we're just really, really, really excited to do this. And, It'll essentially be the last baseball game at the Coliseum. You know, three days later, they tear up that turf and it becomes a soccer stadium. So um, this will be bittersweet uh, for me as a baseball fan, but I know it'll mean so much more to Reggie and all those guys who have been on that field for 40, 50 years. Yeah, and, and Reggie, if you want to speak to that bittersweetness, I mean, you're you're bringing together, yeah, like the the A's legends essentially all in one place. It's going to be amazing. Uh, yeah, at the same time, um, this is a field that's going to be a soccer field. This is a team that's that has left already. Um, what, what are your emotions heading into this? Um, I'm down about it. And I think everybody uh, around Oakland and in the Bay Area is, I haven't met anybody that's happy that, that the A's are leaving. And whether it's, you know, as far north, I was in Sacramento last night, whether you're in Sacramento or whether you go down into Fresno and, and Lodi and places like that that are, you know, 70, 80 miles away. Um, you know, people are sad uh, that the A's are leaving. They're sad how it's happened, um, where the team just got to the point to where they weren't very competitive. Um, most of their, their good players are sprayed around. The Giants got one and uh, third base, and then the guy that comes to mind is the guy that hit 50 home runs, 53 home runs for the Atlanta Braves, and you know it just it just started, uh, you know, many years ago of the team just not being what it could be, and the fans could feel it coming. Um, so there there is some hard and harsh feelings, um, you know, between the different factions that 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 seem to solidify themselves and, and divide. Um, you know, I'm really sad for the fans and sad for the town economically, et cetera. Um, Oakland has lost all of its team, teams. They lost the basketball team. They lost the Raiders. I know that uh, Mark Davis did not want to go, didn't want to leave town, but couldn't get a stadium built. And for whoever, whatever reason, for whatever fault, uh, you can blame, but right now we're at a situation where uh, we have failed uh, to keep the team. Uh, we've failed to to make some kind of build some kind of bridge or to create a desire for the team to stay. I do know that fans want to want the team here. They're sad, um, and I just kind of want to have a, a a great big barbecue, a great big a celebration of a, a fun fest on Sunday uh, to share thoughts and ideas. Um, I'm going to have a few of the guys speak to the crowd. Um, 
I wouldn't mind asking a couple of people from the crowd to come and speak. Um, and so uh, we're going to share our sadness and uh, do our best to, to have the healing uh, and to be able to get over it. And so I'm, I'm grateful that Brian came to us with this idea and uh, look forward to really being there, you know, just uh, with, with all the other guys. And, um, you know, Barry Bonds is coming over and that's going to be fun. And you know, I con connected with Joe Rudy and, and, and Fingers. They both got a little, little small health issue. Uh, Raleigh's got a back issue, so not, not don't be alarmed. Uh, and Joe Rudy's been traveling all over uh, with family and grandchildren and stuff like that. And I talked to Chili Davis. I talked to Mike Davis a couple of days ago. He's got a little league game somewhere and can't quite make it. But uh, so many of the guys that aren't going to be there are um, – you know, sending their, you know, thanks, uh, Reggie, for asking and asking. But, um, you know, I, I'm thanking uh, uh, Brian and um, his Change the Game Sports. And we've got Bump Box, which is from him, and Evo Shield, Oakley, Rawlings, Nike. And the, the guy that steps up for me all the time is uh, Ralph Lauren and the Jordan brand. Michael's always there to to give us some shoes or to give us something to um, uh, let, let his uh, let, let him be felt that he cares. Yeah. And, you know, Reggie, you played for those, the Steinbrenners, you played, you know, the legendary A's team in the seventies, you've been connected to a bunch of front offices and ownership groups. Um, I'm curious what you think about this A's leadership with John Fisher and Dave Cavill. Well, uh, I think I'm like most, uh, I, I don't know them well. I've, I've had uh, uh, not many conversations with uh, uh, Dave Cavill. I've never had a difficult or bad conversation with him. I've never really had a bad conversation with John Fisher. Um, you know, I don't know if I don't know if I would have done that way. Uh, but before you know, I, and, and I can tell you that when the team was sold for 140 to somewhere between 140 and 160 million, I was high bidder. I was high bidder and willing to pay 25 million more than any other bid, but our commissioner didn't see fit to present my offer. He asked me to go through him. Um, and it never really got done. So I was disappointed. I don't think the team would be where it is today um, if, if I was connected with ownership. But, uh, I, I, you know, it, you, you, I don't really want to uh, badmouth anybody. I'm disappointed where they are. I'm disappointed that they're leaving. I'm disappointed the way it's handled. Um, and so I'm still an Oakland fan, and I'm going to share my sorrows and share my tears uh, Sunday with uh, other people that uh, are going to be there and we're going to try to do our best to put on a great show. Yeah. And so you had the highest bid back in whatever, whatever it was when, when, uh, when Fisher yes. bought the team. Yes. And why did they, why did, why were you not let in? Well, we always wondered that, you know, there, there really haven't been any mi minorities uh, in ownership uh, that much. And now it gets scarcer because the numbers start with, with, uh, they start at 10 figures, uh, now. And so, um, there aren't very many blacks or minorities are going to be able to participate at that level. So, um, uh, it's been an, an effective fence, um, an unclimbable fence now that, uh, that's been built. But, um, you know, I, I know I was high bidder, People know I was high bidder. Close people around me know I was high bidder. Baseball knows I was high bidder, and it uh, it didn't happen. Yeah, well, I'm sorry it didn't. Uh, Brian, in light of everything we've been talking about, what do you see as the significance of this event you're putting on on Sunday? Well, I think it goes back to, you know, Reggie is the icon, right? He's he brought so many great memories to that city, to that team, to those fans. And being that he's essentially kind of sending it off, I thought was pretty cool. You know, uh, you know, doing it right. I can't tell you how many fans have DM'd us or sent us a message. And, you know, I I'm sure uh, Ryan, who's Reggie's right hand, has gotten, you know, the equivalent of messages in, in Reggie's DMs about thank you. Appreciate you guys doing this. This is going to be fun. This is going to be bittersweet. And so I think it's, 
you know, in this world, there's a lot of bad. And when you can do some good in this world, it's uh, it feels good inside. It feels good to honor Reggie and somebody who I looked up to, you know, growing up as a kid. Like I said, this all basically started at, you know, eight, nine years old for me. Didn't know it at the time. But as I got older, I felt there was more of a purpose for us to somehow not let these legends go to their graves without really knowing how important they were to so many people like me who grew up behind them, who idolized them, wanted to swing a bat, throw a football, you know, shoot a basketball. You know, we're big Kobe fans over here. You know, we'd love to do something with Kobe here in the near future. Um, we have a lot of friends there. Byron Scott hosts our podcast for us called Fast Break. We have a podcast with Byron Scott. And so, you know, we have some conversations uh, going around doing something with the Lakers. Hopefully with Kobe, that'd be cool. But just, you know, Sunday is just going to be one of those days where, you know, for me, it's one of those feel good things that we were able to work so hard to put this together and it all came together and, and Reggie's going to get his flowers and um, all those guys. I mean, those guys, I mean, Eckersley and Dave Stewart and Henderson and, you know, Barry's a good friend of mine and, you know, we're going to do his his iteration next year and hopefully with Reggie, we'll keep this going, you know, year after year and maybe we'll see us in New York next year, huh, Reggie? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> you know. Tony, Tony La Russa is coming out on Sunday. He's going to sit yeah. on the bench. Yeah. And we got some of the Bay Area artists out there, too. We've got Too Short coming out. We've got Richie Rich coming out. We've got Mr. Fab coming out. So uh, Oakland's going to be a big part of what we're doing, not just in the stands, but on the field. Yeah. Should be a lot of fun. Reggie Jackson, Brian Amani, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for Thanks, having bro. us. I appreciate you. Up next, we're diving into the world of spring football with Russ Brandon of the United Football League. Football, of course, is the most popular sport in the U.S. by far, but the attempts to introduce a spring football league have so far been unsuccessful. The UFL, which had its first season this year, is trying to change that. We spoke about that and plenty more, and that conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by Russ Brandon, president and CEO of the UFL. Welcome, Russ. Owen, thank you. Great to be with you. Yeah, great to have you on. So the UFL had its first season from March to June of this year. What did you learn about running the league and about spring football in general? It was a hectic year, to say the least. You know, we went through the merger process last year with Legacy XFL and Legacy USFL coming together. We started that process in July. And... Quite honestly, it concluded on January 13th, and we were going to training camp on February 22nd, and we kicked off on March 28th. So um, a lot of work that needed to be done, especially on the commercial and the ticketing side, because we were really prohibited from doing a lot of things. We really couldn't do much during the uh, merger process. So um, really pleased with the product on the field, the ratings, um, how our leagues came together seamlessly. Um, and just the, you know, the overall the Birmingham Stallions who were legacy USFL won their third straight championship in June. And, and just seeing it all come together was heartwarming for all of us, but a lot of work to be done. And, and we're in the midst of that right now. Yeah. I wanted to get into that. I imagine given the quick start you had to throw together there, I'm sure there are things that you would have liked to set up. And now that you've got your first year where you can really prep for it, what do you expect will be different in year two? Just having a little bit of runway, to your point, to to, uh, get things set. You know, we had four teams from Legacy XFL and really with Houston being in both leagues. And then the USFL having Birmingham, Michigan and Memphis. Just putting that all together from a a sales standpoint, from a ticketing standpoint, trying to scale the buildings, all the operational and logistic things that no one really cares about, quite frankly. That's what we're spending a lot of time on uh, because we didn't have, again, that runway last year to really put um, our business practices in place. So just having the runway and the opportunity this off season to get that in place. We went on sale with new season tickets yesterday. We've been in the renewal phase since August and working on our schedule, putting that all together, hopefully announce that here in the next month or so. Um, so just having the opportunity, because a year ago today, we were still the XFL and still had to work in that capacity until the merger was complete. So just time. It's really important for all of us. 
Yeah, and just looking at the places you play, you know, it's not New York, Chicago, LA, but you are in some big mm -hmm. cities. What do you think makes a good UFL market? Passion. Um, we've seen that across the UFL. We saw it in legacy XFL. Obviously, you know, St. Louis gets a lot of play because there are thirty five to forty thousand in that building every week. Um, the Battle Hawks are a big part of the ecosystem, of sports ecosystem in the St. Louis area. Um, you go to DC and you see the Beer Snake, and they fill uh, fill Audi Field each and every week, and just have a, a, a raucous atmosphere in there. You know what we're building in Birmingham. You know, obviously they have a really good team. They've got a great building down there, and you saw that start to pick up last year as well. San Antonio, um, great market, and just building on all of our markets. Um, we have we have front office staff in each market that are working on all the different strategic processes in place for theme nights throughout the course of the year, um, making this a, a year round destination for each of our markets. Um, it takes time to build, but um, we're we're all drinking out of a fire hose here, trying to uh, get year two up and running. But uh, we're excited where it's headed. I'm curious about your relationship to the NFL. You know, obviously your schedules are complementary. You play when the NFL and mm -hmm. when college football yeah. are not playing. Uh, you share one or two markets with the NFL, but mostly you're in different places. How do you see your interaction with the NFL and perhaps college football as well? A very close relationship with the NFL. Um, work diligently with Troy Vincent, the football operations staff, um, on a consistent basis. You know, we had a relationship with the NFL with, with legacy XFL. Um, we've continued that with the UFL and focusing on on areas such as technology, innovation, how do you assist the underserved populations in our game? We've had a female official on every crew in the UFL. We've seen uh, not only our players uh, go to the NFL, but we've seen officials head to the NFL. We've seen Zach Woodfin, our head of strength and conditioning, is now the head of strength and conditioning for the Tennessee Titans. You know, we've had close to 90 players sign NFL contracts um, coming out of legacy, uh, out of the UFL. And then when you look at uh, legacy XFL and USFL, we've had close to 140 players sign. So when we look at, you know, obviously we're a standalone professional league in the spring, but how do we adga advance the game of football is very important to us. And, you know, when we look at technology and innovation, we're a league of innovation. So when you look as an example, our, our Apple iPads that we have, that we've had for the last few years um, in place where coaches and players see live video, um, it ties into DB Sport Rewind. You can look at offense and defense in real time and down and distance game, play clock, penalties, all that, right? And again, you know, look, working with the NFL on a consistent basis in those specific areas, football operation wise, to see where we can continue to improve and assist the game. Yeah. And to that point, I think one of the fun things about upstart leagues is that you don't have the legacy of people expecting a certain product and you can experiment and have fun with it. At the same time, you want your players to be scoutable by the NFL. And obviously you want it to be something where fans can watch and, and see some a product they mostly recognize I'm wondering what areas you found you can play around with an experiment. That's a great question. You know, we, we, we pride ourselves on being very innovative, as I mentioned, but we also are very focused of not being gimmicky. Um, we work closely, like I said, with the league, but we've, we've, we've had a lot of feedback from fans and how we present the game from a content standpoint as well. So if you look at our player to coach communication, um, our transparency, with our officials back to the command center with Dean Blandino and Mike Pereira, and fans can listen to that dialogue when they're trying to make decisions. Again, when you look at the, the replay on the sidelines, the true line technology video that you see with down in distance that um, Fox rolled out in, we rolled out, but Fox had been working on. So, you know, from that standpoint, we can be creative on that end, but making sure that the integrity of the game stands alone on itself. There's a lot of good players in our league. We have 400 players that made rosters last year, and over 300 of those athletes have 
been either on an NFL roster or been in training camp. So, and many of them are trying to continue that dream. And some are just trying to continue the dream of playing football. So we've, we've focused a lot on, on the product side, on the coaching side. When you look at our roster of coaches, uh, we just added Ken Wisenhunt in, in Memphis. Um, some really pedigreed, credentialed coaches with a lot of pelts on the wall. As for your player pipeline and the challenges of operating a league where the true success for many of your players is leaving the league, going to the NFL, what sort of difficulties does that introduce for you? We celebrate it. Um, if that's what's important to that individual, um, it's a little bit like when you're in AAA and you watch the stars of tomorrow go to the big leagues, right? Um, it's an opportunity to, to follow that individual. Um, you've seen it last week. Um, you saw the Dallas Detroit game, you know, a long kickoff return by Turpin, um, tackled by our kicker Jake Bates. And, you know, those are all byproducts of our league, right? So it's great to see, um, these guys continue to chase what they're chasing if that's what they want. So we do, we celebrate that. And, you know, we'll continue to have great people on the personnel side, Doug Whaley. Um, is our head of player personnel, and he was a former GM of the Buffalo Bills. He was a longtime personnel executive with the Steelers. Jim Pop, um, longtime Canadian Football League general manager. And then each team has eight general managers as well that all have long NFL scouting personnel pedigree. So uh, they they know what uh, stones to look under to find fine athletes. And we've had a lot of – we've had every showcase sold out this summer. We have two more left over the next two months where we're looking for players uh, everywhere. Thinking about spring football generally, there's a reason this is year one of the UFL. Obviously, you had the XFL and the USL, USFL coming together. Uh, both of those were new attempts at making spring football work. There are previous attempts in the 90s, of course. I'm wondering, given the massive popularity of football in the US, why it hasn't taken off in the past and why you think the UFL is going to be the one that fits? Um, like everything, it starts with ownership. Um, we have incredible ownership when you look at, um, Fox, uh, Redbird Capital, um, who bought the XFL, legacy XFL out of bankruptcy from WWE with Danny Garcia, who was our chairwoman at the XFL and Dwayne Johnson, right? So when we brought that together to, instead of having two disparate leagues to have one, um, this is a much needed league. And we saw it in our ratings. We've seen it in our pipeline back to the NFL from a player standpoint, from a development standpoint. And there's a lot of reasons, to your point, Owen, on why these leagues haven't sustained over time. Um, quite, you know, I, I sort of put the old USFL and the old XFL in a different bucket, you know, back in the 80s and then in, in 2000. But when you look at... um the XFL of 2020, they were on a very good path until the pandemic, right? So obviously no one foresaw that. And the USFL and the XFL were off to very good starts. It made sense for us to come together. And I truly believe that this league will be here, obviously much beyond my years. And it has a very solid place in the ecosystem, not only from a viewing standpoint, but what is needed in the game of football. We'll leave it there. Russ Brandon, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Oh, and thanks for having me. Time now for Front Office Sports tomorrow. We will look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. Angel Reese is getting a signature shoe with Reebok, but you'll have to wait for it. The kicks are coming in 2026. Since Shaquille O'Neal took over as president of Reebok Basketball, Reese has been the athlete most heavily associated with the brand. The fact that they are announcing her shoe this far out shows that they are committed to her long term. As much as we talk about Caitlin Clark, Reese is just as good an example as someone who has carried her star power from college into the WNBA. That's it for today. Leave us a rating or review wherever you like to tune in and tell your friends about the show. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.